Debates over priority setting and where issues of race, gender, class and identity fit don't stop at the borders of the United States. Not long ago, I was invited to participate in a meeting in South Africa convened by the Transnational Institute and the Alternative Information and Development Center based in Cape Town. There I had a chance to get two student activists from the Global Movement for Black Lives to sit down for a conversation. The more Masera Maru and Jonai Strong talked, the more they found they had in common. Fights over rising university fees, for one thing. Maru was one of the leaders of the Fees Must Fall, Roads Must Fall campaigns at the University of Cape Town. It was against fee hikes and a statue celebrating Cecil Rhodes, prime minister of the colonial apartheid state. Strong works with BYP 100, the Black Youth Project in Chicago. If we want to go fundamentally, we're up against just the ability for black people, for marginalized oppressed people to self-determine. Basically, the right to be. That's yeah. what I think mm -hmm. black people are fighting or being suppressed. Like, you know, the, the suppressions about and what they're fighting for is the right to to be. It's a very deep-rooted fight mm -hmm. um, and a deep-rooted oppression. I was involved in student activist spaces for the longest time, but um, mostly I think the height of my activism was during the Rhodes and Swole movement. Black students rallied around the cause for decolonization at the university. And this is after a black student at the university threw pool on the Cecil John Rose statue very big statue that sat on the university property for over 50 years. And so students started to have, I think that that particular moment was important because it's, many of us connected with it in a particular way, you know, um, and it inspired a conversation. And so days later, some of us decided to, to start organizing around the idea of decolonizing and firstly removing the statue because I think it was a representation of everything mm -hmm. that was wrong in the university, you know. Mm -hmm. We were also calling into question the idea of this rainbow nation where everything and everyone seems to be living in peace, but so many people's lives had not changed. I think what Rose Miss Fall was doing was calling that into question that like also that black students on campus on campus and part of the university had to we're in a permanent state of an existential crisis mm. of of existing within the space and then getting out and then going back to poverty mm -hmm. and this double life we all had to live and also a double life that that required us to integrate you know in a particular way to assimilate because you will not exist without assimilation as i like hear the story that Masay is telling i just find so much similarity in america systems are able to compromise or come to a line to a point where we may think that mm -hmm. things are different but like the real lived actual um day-to-day -day for people is still the same mm -hmm. i started my activism um when i was in college I was a part of a university community where I knew that I was there because I was able to get into this university because they were affording like certain people to be there like on scholarship. And so I was like, okay, this is an opportunity for me to go to school, to get a good job, to get money and to like move my family up. And so there's this kind of like ethos of folks who are in a working class position that to be socially mobile is how you go into this strata mm -hmm. of success and then you bring it to your family. And then that's how we're gonna incrementally all kind of get on the same page. Mm -hmm. By the time I got to almost my last year in university was the killing of Trayvon Martin and then the acquittal of George Zimmerman. And I think myself, I was situated in this really interesting point in history where a lot of young like black millennials were understanding that there is no protection for us. We're gonna mm -hmm. have to self-determine, we're gonna have to figure out how to do this. Mm -hmm. And then we became a part of this longer legacy of like black self-determination. Um, and so it's been since that time that we've been trying to not only critique the state, um, but also learn how to provide alternatives. So I organized with Black Youth Project 100, which is under the, the larger Black Lives Matter movement. We're understanding that in terms of breaking down these social hierarchies, we have to be able to express those values in the way that we interact. Mm -hmm. so, so for the organization that I'm in, we have a very large emphasis on black queer leadership, black mm -hmm. queer leadership, gender, gender nonconforming, trans leadership. 
Um, and that when we talk about an issue, we're not just talking about it in terms of one particular group. One thing that BLM did across the nation is we did Say Her Name campaign. So there's this idea that whenever a black man is murdered, that we go into the streets, you know, we do the hashtag and we need to stop the brutalization of black men. Mm -hmm. But then also we have to understand the sexual violence, the sexual assault and the brutalizing of black women, them, gender non-conforming and trans folks as well. Liberation movements were kind of like a single, single issue movement. And I think this is there's now a clear refusal from our side in saying we will not write out people from history. And the root of it is that this is not new in the sense of mm -hmm. the actual day to day of the movement. Movements have always been heralded by black oppressed, um, other otherwise oppressed feminine bodies, mm -hmm. but they have not been able to, as Masay said, be included in the history. This project of self determination is important because it gives us an an opportunity to break those things down, mm -hmm. recognize our part in perpetuating our own oppression mm -hmm. and doing better. It is breaking that Eurocentric mold that we've been formed in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do it, I know other of us do it, we all kind of go into that mold because this is how we've been socialized. Mm -hmm. But if we can go back to a more authentic understanding of how we're connected to each other, how we're connected to the land, you know, mm -hmm. like that is the way in which we can find a path forward by going a little bit backwards. For me, it's important that we continue growing mm -hmm. and continue learning. For me, it's about the learning because I don't think growth happens without learning, or in the absence of learning. Um, and I think where we're headed is building more transnational, transnational yeah. links mm -hmm. um, and solidarity, strengthening transnational solidarity um, because the fight is getting bigger and uglier, <laughs> mm -hmm. bigger and uglier, and it's coming closer and closer and closer to all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it would be silly for us to wait until it got to our doorsteps. I completely agree with say, and I'm grateful to be able to have these like international, transnational conversations to see what's similar and also see what's particular to our context and how we can build from that. I mean, I think the, the piece that I'm resonating with at this point in being in this work is how deeply personal revolution is. If it's not in your heart, if it's not in your home, then it's not going to go into these external things. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes because it's so deafening the outside external force of like the state or the systems or the government that we get focused there but i think i'm learning more and more that if i can't look in the mirror and see like the blemishes on my face and be able to work with those and understand how i can change those things then i'm not going to be able to have impact outside so i think our movement is needing a lot of healing a lot of truth a lot of discomfort so that we can grow, like growing pain, so that we can actually get to a revolutionary point.